Don Quixote begins with a prologue, which uh, is fairly characteristic to set up uh, some of the details that the book will cover and to, to establish a certain relationship with the reader. And it is in this that Cervantes makes it uh, makes use of it in a very ironic way, in a very fun way, quite honestly. Uh, he starts out, you know, idling reader, addressing directly the reader and making it kind of charming, like, you know, hey, you're not doing anything, you're just lazing around. Idling reader, you may believe me when I tell you that I should should have liked this book, which is the child of my brain, to be the fairest, the sprightliest, and the cleverest that would be ima imagined, but I have not been able to contravene the law of nature, which would have it be, which would have it that like begets like. And so what with it, what was to be expected of a sterile and uncultivated wit such as that which I possess? Which is a uh, rhetorical move in the uh, I, one of the one of the older ones of uh, sort of downplaying expectations of uh, saying you know oh I'm just such a dope and you know I am not worthy of my material I cannot do it justice. Uh, you see that going all the way back to Homer. This is fairly standard stuff, um, but that notion of you know the book is going to be somewhat imperfect. Uh, but it is in a, in a tradition that we see throughout the Renaissance and the Sigla de Auto, a tradition of, well, imperfection uh, has, its, has its dignity too and needs to be taken into account. You can't always write about just, you know, the perfect. This is not a uh, scripture. This is not the lives of saints, the popular literature of the day. Uh, throughout the Middle Ages, but this is a uh, literature about common people, and common people are, by nature, imperfect. They deserve, however, representation within the broader portrait of life. Um, uh, peace and tranquility, the pleasures of the countryside, the serenity of the heavens, the murmur of the fountains, and the ease of mind can do much toward causing the most unproductive of muses to become fecund and bring forth progeny that will be the marvel and delight of mankind. All of those aspects of the natural world, all of those aspects of humanity, uh, mixed with uh, the divine muses, can become the marvel and delight of mankind. Hmm. Right there, that is a very grandiose statement. And you can see at the end of that little, of this short passage, where you begin very humbly, oh, just me, I don't have much to say, and it's kind of ugly, uh, to sweeping, sweeping poetry about, you know, uh, the marvel and delight of all mankind. Little uh, juxtaposition, a little contrast, a little uh, head spinning. Oh. Conflict. Just on the matter of style. It sometimes happens that a father has an ugly son with no redeeming grace whatever, yet Love will draw a veil over the parental eyes. So he's uh, he, he's admitting that you know uh, it's not great, it's imperfect, it's at times quite ugly. But this this book is mine, and I love it all the same. And then he goes into this little passage where he 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 has a uh, the author imagines a friend come over. And he starts uh, bemoaning the limitations of the book, the humility of the book, how it doesn't have this, it doesn't have that, it's not, it's not fancy, it doesn't have all the trappings of a book, an important work of literature. And the, uh, the, the other, the friend who comes in, and he just, what are you worried about? Who cares? Come on, let's, uh, this is silly. 
And then he goes through all the stuff that a book is supposed to have. And he just, you know, don't worry about it. Um, they talk about, you know, citations. You need, uh, you need, uh, you need prefatory quotations. And the friend says, well, you know, sometimes having a little quotation at the front. Yeah, sure. Just toss one in. And he starts reeling off these quotations in Latin from the Greek tradition, from, uh, from the Roman tradition, from the Christian tradition, and it's all Latin and, you know, maybe it's a, a, applicable in some way. Maybe there's some logical co uh, coherence with the, the story itself as a, as a whole, but it, it's, it's all just kind of arbitrary. It's just tossed in there, these cute little sayings, you know, uh, love your enemies. Uh, you know, for out of the heart perceive evil thoughts. Uh, all, all of these little pablum sayings. Uh, freedom is not bought by gold. Pale death knocks at the cottages of the poor and the palaces of the kings with equal foot. These just simple little homilies that mean practically nothing divorced from context. And uh, his friend is just saying, yeah, just scribble some of those in on the front page and it'll be good. And uh, then he starts talking about, you know, well, you know, you, you have to drop in some, uh, some, some other illusions, some literary, you know, representations, some, some little hints here and there just to suggest of how very learned you are. And again, the friend's like, ah, you just toss in this and that and the other thing. It doesn't matter if it doesn't make sense. Let people puzzle over it for, uh, for generations. They can scratch their head for, their, for the rest of eternity and they'll never figure it out and they'll call you a genius for it. Um, and all of this advice, you just think, just don't take it seriously. Don't be, uh, don't worry about it. And he's advocating a kind of insincerity. But it's important to remember that this is a work of fiction. So he, he's arguing for fictional uh, techniques in a work of fiction, which is appropriate in a way. But still, he, he, he's, he's questioning this relationship of the narrator or the author and the reader this relationship which is bound together with a certain kind of trust and this character the the friend is coming in and saying yeah you know screw trust just you know screw with their heads um it it it, it complicates the reading that's about to happen because if this is the author having this conversation and there's no reason to believe that it's a real conversation but if these are the thoughts going in, it suddenly you're not sure how to approach the work itself. You're not sure how to interpret the art. Is this art being sincere? Is it being very ironic? How, how much should I read into anything? And these questions are troubling all over the place because you, you're no longer sure about what you're being told. You're having to objectify it and judge it in ways that you're just not used to. Oh. oh, but then he gives some really interesting advice. All that you have to do is make proper use of imitation in what you write. And the more perfect the imitation, the better your writing will your writing be. Inasmuch as you have no other object in view than that of overthrowing the authority and prestige which books of chivalry enjoy in the world at large and among the vulgar, there is no reason why you should go begging maxims of the philosophers, counsels of holy writ, fables of the poets, orations of the rhetoricians, or miracles of the saints. See to it, rather, that your style flows along smoothly, pleasingly, and sonorously, and that your words are the proper ones meaningfully and well-placed, expressive of your intention in setting them down and of what you wish to say without any intricacy or obscurity. Which is interesting because the way it's putting style over everything else. 
and also saying that, you know, just have it be clear uh, without any intricacy or obscurity, just saying, yeah, so that people can take a surface reading of it. I don't think that that is sincere advice that he is giving to the author in this sense, the friend is giving to the author. Let it be your aim that, by reading your story, the melancholy may be moved to laughter and the cheerful man made merrier still. Let the simple not be bored, but may the, the clever admire your originality. Let the grave ones not despise you, but let the prudent praise you. And keep in mind, above all, your purpose, which is that of undermining the ill-founded edifice that is constituted by these books of chivalry, so abhorred by many, but admired by many more. If you succeed in attaining it, you will have accomplished no little. It's a universal ambition for the work of literature. It's saying we don't necessarily want it to be uh, particularly out of reach. We don't want it to be specialized. This is not for the uh, the uh, you know the, the the classical audience of um, or the classic audience of honestly the the super educated this is more for common folk to read there aren't that many common readers just yet but middle class people who are rising and had the ability to read but were not the um, the intelligentsia so to speak or the the aristocratic or quite frankly, the church. Um, this was for a broader audience. But the way he's emphasizing it makes it seem like, well, maybe there is supposed to be some reading into it there. Because at a certain point, you're not sure how to take this person. This person's sincerity itself seems very complicated. And the way that they, they drill down, quite frankly, on books of chivalry, it's as if they're not supposed to be writing a novel at this point, but just uh, a, a, a book review on this style of literature that had been going back for centuries, which Man of La Mancha makes fun of. Um, but the way that they're repeating it makes it sound like this is just what this book is about, just about undercutting the genre of courtly courtly romance and romantic chivalry and yada, yada, yada. I think there's an awful lot more going on here because they're directing you so far to this one theme. It's misdirection, quite frankly. They're saying, look over here, this is what's happening. And because we're saying that the style has to be so fluid, has to be just based on sonorous qualities, on, on, uh, on appropriate qualities, and just be so crystal clear that, well, of course, we're not talking about anything else whatsoever. And whenever somebody tells you that they're not talking about something, that's when you got to wonder, hmm, I think they're talking about that. So when they're constantly leaning you off in one direction, that's, a, that's an opportunity for you to lean back a bit and say, I don't know if I can trust this, which of course is what the entire prologue is about, about getting an ironic distance, an objective distance from what they're saying so that you don't take it all on face value. And that theme goes throughout the book. Don Quixote is about a man who is uh, swept up in the reality of books of fiction and he can no longer discern between reality and fiction but he is having that breakdown having that trouble while himself being in a work of fiction so there is this complicated onion skin of uh, metafictional considerations, metafictional, bringing you outside so that you can see how the mechanics work, bringing you behind the curtain, behind the scenes, how, pick your metaphor, but it's about being aware of the process of what is being produced. And that's what this work does in that Renaissance mindset of always trying to figure out how things work and questioning so much around you and asserting the dignity of the human being to sit there and judge what is happening around you and not be taken in. 
This is what the prologue puts there immediately. Before Don Quixote steps onto the stage, we are told to beware. We as readers are told to be on the lookout for subtleties that perhaps, perhaps, we would not otherwise be aware of. In this, in this way, Cervantes is being, I would argue, both very generous and very honest, but also a little sneaky. And that's the fun of Don Quixote.